for the issues with the dealer. Um, that would be a little introduction, but I think you would already have left this morning if you were afraid of meta talking. So I just going on to the next slide. I have a very short presentation actually, just 15 minutes, and I have three parts essentially. In the first part, I'm going to talk to make this really efficient, what Margaret is not. So I sometimes hear some rumors what people think Margaret is, so I'm just giving you some keywords about what Margaret is not or what Margaret is not doing. And then I'm going to details with some facts, so I'm going to tell you what actually can be done or what are the properties of Margaret. And last but not least, if there is enough time, I will show you a, a quick demo of the key points of Margaret. Okay, so let's directly dive into the rumor part. So what is it not? So first of all, Margaret is not trying to model UML or, or to, to think about the class structure and the properties, etc. It's only, it's only a way to describe your classes inside the image. Then, as a difference to the other uh, frameworks that have been presented this morning, uh, Mavi does not use any code generation. These are all just visitors that walk over these description objects and do something meaningful. And I think, especially this part, is uh, quite powerful. And then, last but not least, but probably the strongest uh, rumor about uh, <laughs> Margaret is that Margaret has nothing really to do with Seaside. Okay, I agree that there is a plugin for Margaret that generates uh, Seaside user interfaces from, from Margaret description. But that's not the central part of it. It can be used for many other things, and you will see uh, in a couple of minutes some uh, more examples. So let's have a, uh, a look at the details. So this is how I actually see Margaret uh, today. So Margaret is essentially an enhancement to the reflective capabilities of Smalltalk. So we all know that Smalltalk has very strong reflective capabilities, so for example you can iterate over all the classes existing in the system and you can look at what variables these classes can define and with Magrit you can actually enhance this information so for example you can say, yeah in this variable I expect a type, uh, for example a string and I want to give it the label uh, username so that you can build from this uh, information an actual user interface and this is very useful and these are all properties that are not, not really available just by using the standard reflection. Then another property is that uh, Magrit is very extensible and very open, so any aspect of Magrit can be extended or customized in any way. So for example, extensibility of applications is ensured. So if you define a description or a class, you can always, from a different package, extend this description or modify this description or even remove this description. And that's very powerful. For example, the peer content management system is using this very principle to basically do all the magic with all these plugins that are available. Then, uh, Magrit is self reflective. So, Magrit is described in itself. So, you can use Magrit to edit the Magrit metamodel. I will show you uh, some more things in the demo. And essentially, um, um, well, that's, that's uh, the result of that, that it's self-reflective. So actually, end users can be enabled to edit certain parts or the whole model of your application <coughs> on the fly while the application is running. So they use the Magrit editors to edit the Magrit descriptions instead of, as in traditional applications, just uh, the, the domain, the domain uh, model. Then that's probably interesting if you want to use Magrit in your projects. So it's open source, it's MIT licensed, and it currently runs on all these platforms, so on Squeak, Faro, on Syncom Smalltalk, Gemstalk Smalltalk, 
and very recently it has been ported to new small talks. <coughs> Don Paolo wants to create uh, user interfaces with GTK automatically and uh, why we think to them uh, like some So the the punchline that I want you to remember is with Margaret you describe exactly at one place and you get a functionality everywhere everywhere where there is essentially a, a visitor that walks over these descriptions and takes advantage of these uh, added capabilities. Good, so that brings me already through the, the demos. I first have some general overview of what I have been doing with Margaret, but there are uh, plenty of plugins available to do other things. I'm not talking about these here. These are just things that I have been doing in open source projects like here and in commercial projects as well. So in one corner, you can use Margaret to build user interfaces. So you can build viewers automatically, for example. You can build editors that edit objects, that validate objects as well before actually committing uh, the changes to the objects. You can build reports. <coughs> So this all happens automatically. You just load, for example, the Seaside plugin to get this functionality for free for uh, Seaside. Then you can also use it, and that's visible on the upper right corner, uh, to ease the, the development process uh, in the Smalltalk environment. For example, in Smalltalk you always have these, these initialize methods, or you have to customize the copying of objects, and that's sometimes a bit annoying to do all the time. So that's why also Magic uh, supports that kind of thing. So it allows you to define initial values for your objects, for example, or to specify how objects are copied. So when you create a deep copy, sometimes that's quite difficult to decide what you want to copy or what you want uh, to leave out. And then it's not because it's also a means for documentation. So you document your code in exactly state what an object is uh, meant to do. Then uh, in the lower left corner we have the whole persistency thing. So Magnet can be used to do object relational mapping or it can be used to map to object databases or several output formats like JSON, XML or the, the, the Moose MSE format. And last but not least it can be used for example to build indexes of objects in a, uh, object databases, which is, if you if done manually, quite a cumbersome talk, a task, but uh, with Smugrid you can do this automatically. And last but not least, and this is the thing that I'm going to show you in the demo, is the end user customizability. So end users are actually able to get their hands onto the Smugrid description and change part or the whole model of your talk found through a user interface. And that's what I'm going to show you now. Um, I'm doing this in the peer content management system. So there is the browser. Here it is. Well, let's try to get the solution. <coughs> Peer. I changed a bit the standard style, so it might not look that familiar, but it's essentially just peer. So if I hit edit here, I get my wiki entry field where I can say uh, hello, Jason, and that's it. And of course, this form is just built uh, from Magnet description, so there is no code that actually defines these input fields. So for example, when I go here into Squeak and say open peer browser, I get essentially a different user interface, but I can go here to the page and when I click here on edit, I get the same form, but not rendered for the web, but rendered for uh, a more user interface. So what if I now want to change that form? So for example, I want to add another edit field here, for example, to track my views on this particular page. Well, that's super easy with Magrid. I can just say edit meta. And now I'm actually on the meta level and I'm editing that meta model of this edit command. So here you already see the title field. 
in the level field, I can even edit the existing descriptions, even so they are defined in the code. But that would just override the default behavior. And to add now here, for example, a to-do list, <coughs> I would just choose some decent field and say to-do. There are certain settings that I can choose. For example, I can make it searchable. This will ensure that when I search something here, that the page will appear if it appears in the to-do field. It's probably not necessary here. You can choose other properties. For example, I can choose the view that is used to display this property. In this case, this is not very interesting, but in some more complex cases, for example, when you have a choice, you can choose between auction boxes and drop down lists, for example. So let's save that. Let's save the meta model. And you see, I'm still in the same application. And immediately when I go to edit, I have this new field with uh, my to do items. I can say uh, clean up. I can save that and this is automatically persistent and uh, appears again when I edit it again. So that's about what I planned to show you. If there are any questions, uh, I'm happy to answer them. Yes? How do you customize layout or relationship between uh, properties and attributes? Okay, so two questions. The first question, the layout. So uh, I, I think you are talking about the, the Seaside plugin because Margaret doesn't know anything about layout by default. Okay, so here I can actually add CSS classes to description objects that end up as a widget here on the, in the form. So it's I, not reflected in my bridge, so this is completely separate. Now that's, a, that's as an extension method on the description. So I extensively use extension methods. And the Margaret packages adds actually additional properties to the description objects. And I use a similar mechanism so that you don't need to mix your model and view code so I can extend descriptions that are defined in the code without actually overriding this method but by adding an extension method that uses some kind of uh, reflective trick to modify the other method or the other definition of the description. So this ensures a, a clean separation of, of view and model but uh, the things are still in the same class, just in a different package. The second uh, part was uh, how you connect uh, between attributes. Is there a relationship? Uh, yeah. Define relationships? There are, actually, that's, that's I think, uh, the weakest part of market, how the relationships are built. I honestly must say that I mostly do that by just adding new code by hand. That's quite easy to do. But there is some ready-made stuff here as well, as you see. This is the, what the standard uh, distribution comes with. So I can, for example, add a one to M relation here. And there are some settings that I can choose here. And it shows then a report of these elements. Or you can choose other uh, components probably to display. So it, it's quite powerful, but in most cases, I made the experience that that this is it's really difficult to do fully automatically because usually there are a lot of things that you need to customize for your particular case. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah. You said you know code generation. Where did the new code uh, state for the to do go? Dictionaries. So I. I, if you if you want to allow your end users to change the meta model, then you essentially need a dictionary where you can store your values, and you need a place to store the new meta model that overrides the default one that the uh, developer has specified. Yeah. Um, do you find the subclass chains of the visitors? Um, naturally cross boundaries. For example, we noticed that the seaside form and the uh, squeak form looked very similar. Should I, would I, is that because one of them subclasses the other in terms of layout or simply because when no. building them you naturally follow the same style? Well, there is a superclass that comes for yeah. something reasonable for displaying descriptions uh, that result in some kind of form. Yeah. Um, Seaside and morphic uh, display are just <coughs> two independent subclasses that can also load, be loaded independently of each other. Right, okay, yeah. 
I was wondering if you decided you wanted your forms laid out in different way, for example, just some stu I was thinking yeah. of something stupid like, like bread first instead of depth first or something like that, um, would it be easy to m push that change across the whole thing or should I expect to see a, a subclass tree, a separate subclass tree of the superclass and then the morphic one, the yeah, that's not too easy just to, to create no. any layout. So this is the default that you get if yeah. you do nothing, if you don't apply any style sheet. But now since all these elements essentially have style sheets, you can, in the style sheet, rearrange them quite freely. Yeah. Yeah. And also, this part here, the functionality actually, this can be just replaced by a different component. Yeah. By a different seaside component, either from Magritte or you write it yourself. Yeah. And then you can custom it this way. Or then in the in the first part, if you really want to have this element there and the other one somewhere totally different, then you can just create your own visitor that knows yeah. how to go over this and <coughs> how to do the layout. Yeah. I was wondering if you were do you find yourself being taken to the situation of breaking up the visitor into the, maybe a number of things that delegate to each other or maybe maybe a, a f for future or you think no that's not a way to go um, well I've never had th yeah. that issue it's never it's never been a problem I, it was always solvable using CSS or yeah. custom visitor yeah. yeah no need to go there until it but if you have a particular problem you can show it to me then we can discuss how right, this is solved